going to get approval for the very first Bitcoin Spot ETF. It really is quite epic. I mean, just a few months ago, most people that I knew were saying it's not going to happen, it's not going to happen. And now it looks like it actually will. Of course, it's not a done deal. We can't say 100% certain that we're going to get it next week, but it would be really, really aggressive move from the SEC were they to, were they to pull the rug now. I have been thinking a bit about what the worst case scenario would be. Obviously, the worst case scenario would be the SEC being totally aggressive and at the same time cancelling the Bitcoin futures ETF so that we couldn't then say that it's inconsistent. They've never done that before though, that is not, not even a 1% likelihood. If they really wanted to play dirty, they could delay again, that's possible. It would mean some you know, scrambling on the part of the ARC ETF for instance, maybe they'd have to refile, who knows. It's most likely that the SEC will give the green light next week because not doing so is just going to create a colossal amount of work for the SEC, which as they have often reminded us is understaffed. Yeah, I was just about to ask what the what the impetus would be to play dirty at this point. It would be the SEC not having read through all of the documents, having perhaps some internal discussions they still want to have, or perhaps just being thoroughly pissed off with the entire industry. But I'm not saying that the SEC is unprofessional, but um, that would be the impetus. So the most practical reason would be that they haven't had time to go over the documents. But again, I think that's very unlikely. The most practical thing to do now, the most efficient and the safest politically for the SEC is just to approve these already. There was a survey out by Bitwise, I don't remember if it was yesterday or the day before, I thought it was really interesting, a survey of advisors. Um, and my takeaway from it was that many advisors are still thinking there is not going to be an approval, um, but that if there was, they would be very interested in helping their clients allocate through any gap. What did you make of that survey? We do have to bear in mind that most advisors don't follow crypto. Most, as we saw from the survey, in fact, which is an incredible document, I recommend everyone read it if they get ahead, if they can. It shows that most uh, advisors are not interested in crypto. Something like seventy percent have not allocated uh, clients to crypto, and no, even more than that. Sorry, something like ninety percent have not, and seventy percent of those have no intention of doing so. So. They are not following this, obviously. Otherwise, a much higher percentage than 40% would be in, would, would believe that we do have one coming. It is interesting that many of them say those that are planning to allocate are waiting for an ETF. Well, there's a solution to that. If I can throw in one more thing about that really interesting document you mentioned there, Tanaya, and that is the most interesting part of that always every year is the barriers to investment. That is the key of this document, for me anyway. And the big takeaway this time is that one of the key barriers, which is lack of a liquid, reliable exchange traded vehicle through which to get exposed, well, that barrier is probably about to be removed. And other barriers such as lack of regulatory clarity, there's progress on that. It's slow and excruciating, but it is progressing. Others are the volatility, fair enough. That's what investors advisors have to you know, take into account their clients' needs, and many of them can't really afford the kind of volatility, fair enough. But one takeaway, my biggest takeaway from that list of the barriers is that there is still so much education that is needed in this space. Many investment advisors say that they would not allocate crypto for their clients because it's a scam or because they don't understand it or because it's associated with illicit trade, that kind of thing. There's just a lot of education that is still needed. And here's the big kicker. The approval of Bitcoin spot ETFs is going to kick that education onto a different kind of level, different kind of mainstream acceptance. When we see Bitcoin in the same frame, in the same sentence, in the same ad as names such as BlackRock, Invest, Invesco, Fidelity, when Bitcoin becomes part of the mainstream financial landscape, that's a different level of education. And so we'll see that list probably change quite a lot between now and now. Next year. Let's get away from the ETF for a little bit. Um, you know, it's been the ETF has been a big driver of Bitcoin price. Uh, what do you make of the volatility in crypto this week, which was not, you know, Bitcoin alone? It seemed to be kind of a straight line up over the last couple of months. At least that's what it's. At least that's what it felt like. And then, you know, a little bit more tumultuous to kick off the new year. What do you make of it? Oh, it's welcome back volatility. We'd missed it, to be honest. I mean, the doldrums of the past two years, I'll guess. I know 23 was a much better year than 22. I remember before but BlackRock filed their application, how absolutely flat and stagnant it was in the market last year. 
Absolutely, and, and even after, after the initial flurry of excitement had died down, volatility is not really back. It's a bit better, but it's not really back. Liquidity is not really back. Keiko put out their Q4 report recently, which shows that liquidity in terms of market depth has not yet recovered to pre-FTX levels and hasn't really moved that much, even after the BlackRock announcement. Now, this could change once the ETFs are launched, because we do have some very big name authorized participants coming into the market, and it's going to be in their interest to do some market making on Bitcoin itself as well, I presume. So I do think this will change, and that is going to start a whole new flywheel of investor demand. The lack of volatility, uh, co in, you know, contrary to what the Bitwise uh, survey is saying, the lack of volatility for most institutional investors is a barrier. Bitcoin's volatility, to pick the largest currency as an example, it's a feature, it's not a bug. For volatility, uh, you know, you, there's risk. So the volatility is what compensates the risk in outsized returns. Also, volatility is what brings in liquidity because for many of the market makers, if it's not volatile, they're not really gonna be able to cover their hedging costs. So it's just not worth their while. High frequency traders as well, they need more volatility to be able to make money in the Bitcoin market. When they come back, Volatility will come back, liquidity will come. Tuition. We've never seen this much interest from people that don't really know much about ETFs or traditional finance to, for that matter. People have become legal experts. I mean, I knew a lot of this stuff from a higher level. I knew some of it, but I've had to get way deeper in the weeks because our clients and just people in general are demanding to understand every step of the process of what's going on here. And it makes sense, really. I mean, the, people have been trying to launch this thing for 10 years. There's politicians involved. There's deadlines. There's billions of dollars at stake. Like, this is, this is a big deal. And there's a reason there's getting a lot of coverage and interest from both the media and asset allocation perspective. So once the SEC does approve the Bitcoin ETFs, and that's a you know when, not if kind of question, and we've been deliberating on the when, um, how do investors figure out which Bitcoin ETF they, they want to buy? I mean, are we going to have a Super Bowl 2024 full of Bitcoin ETF commercials? I, I, I wouldn't count out Super Bowl commercials for sure. I mean, we've already seen a whole bunch of issuers um, with their own commercials. I mean, we have Vandex, Hashdex, Bitwise. Um, everyone's doing different things to market their, their own products. And like I said, it tends to be winner take most, not winner take all. So right now we're looking at 11 issuers. I don't know if there's room for 11 different spot Bitcoin ETF products, but there's definitely room for multiple. So some people are only going to care about the fee. They want the cheapest fee. That's how they're going to get exposure. Some are going to care about the brand name. There's undoubtedly going to be advisors out there that just trust BlackRock and that's what they're going to use or Fidelity or what have you. Some people are going to stick with Grayscale because they've been using them. Some might want a more crypto centric offering from somebody like Bitwise or Hashtags or Valkyrie. And then there's people in the middle like Van Eck and Invesco is partnered with Galaxy. So there's no way to know how this is going to play out. One of the other things I'm focused on is the issue, a bunch of the ETFs out there now, you don't actually see the on-chain address. So you can't see exactly where the Bitcoin is. Maybe some of the bigger issuers aren't going to release those addresses so you can check it yourself to see if the Bitcoin is there. But some of these smaller issuers, I, I, I'd be shocked if we don't see a handful of these ETFs just saying, here, you can double check where, mm -hmm. whether or not we have this Bitcoin that we say we have, because that's a huge concern in the Bitcoin world. They think it's going to be paper Bitcoin and not have, actually have exposure to Bitcoin. But I can pretty much guarantee you some of these filers are going to publish their, their Bitcoin addresses so anyone and their mother can go on and look to make sure the Bitcoin is actually there when they say it is. And those financial advisors, you talk to those people all the time. A Lot. Yeah. How are they making the decision of which one? Is it going to be purely, I mean, as you know, a lot of the ETF flows right now are fee based. Is right. that what it's going to be? Is it that the cheapest one is going to win? The cheapest one's certainly going to have a bit of a leg. We already know that Invesco and Galaxy are going to waive the fee for the first six months. That's always a little bit of a gimmick. I don't think most advisors get sucked into those kinds of fee waivers. Um, if one of the big players, the big known names, say like a BlackRock or a Fidelity or somebody, comes out with the cheapest one, I think that's tough to compete against. But interestingly, I think it's where the volume is in the first couple of weeks that matters more than the cost. So in that case, it does matter who starts trading first. It can, because if we get a big slug of volume and then the derivatives market shows up and all of a sudden we have a live options market on that particular ticker, that's very hard to ever upset. So we've seen this before with things like gold, GLD finally started trading options. You could come out with the cheapest, best gold product in the world. You'll never pry GLD out of that derivatives ecosystem. Do we know that there is going to be an options market automatically? Like if the SEC approves it, 
do they approve it all? Is there then options? So then it's, is, is then it would game? go to the actual options dealers to decide effectively when they want to do this. Now, when GLD got options, there was a bit of a hiccup there about how it was going to be cleared, et cetera. I have a feeling those conversations have long since happened already. Everybody understands that the options market on this is going to be enormously valuable and enormously powerful. I mean, we, you guys have talked about it a ton of times. Single, you know, people trading zero date expiration options is almost replacing people trading stocks in some cases. I think you're going to see something very similar happen here with Bitcoin. I suspect we'll have a good, clean options chain with real volume on it within weeks at the, on the outside and possibly within days if somebody's done a lot of pre-planning. Wow. Dave, thank you so much for being on the show today. That was great insight. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for having me. One thing that I do caution these Wall Street investors is you can't trade this like other assets. We saw just yesterday about a billion dollars of open interest got wiped out. The guys over at Reflexivity Research did a fantastic job outlining saying, you know, this asset in 2021 went up almost 800 percent from uh, before the pandemic started to the kind of the top of the market. Yeah. During that time, there was five 30 percent drawdowns. If you're going to try to get levered long and think that, hey, ETF gets proven, this thing just goes to the moon, you're likely to get shaken out or get liquidated. That is really good advice. Just beware the volatility. But, I mean, this thing is, is on a risk return basis. It's the, by far the most attractive asset in all the financial markets, but it comes with tons and tons of volatility. And so if you go back to 2017, it was $1,000. We're 45x since 2017. But along the way, we've had two 80% drawdowns a plethora, I can't even count how many, you know, 30 plus percent drawdowns. And so Wall Street is saying, hey, the ETF's coming, here we go. Now, I do think over a long period of time, Bitcoin's price is gonna continue to go up. We're gonna have a persistent bid from all these ETFs. Another thing people aren't talking about, everyone's talking about the primary uh, fund flows. So retail or institutions buying this ETF, but actually what we're starting to see now is other publicly listed funds or ETFs are changing their prospectus to say that they can put up to 15% of their AUM in the Bitcoin yeah. ETF. So if you have the best performing asset and you've got an ETF that's lagging, why would you not put you Bitcoin know, in your ETF? But all of this really formalizes the greater fool aspect of why Bitcoin should go up, right? <laughs> it's just there's more there, there are more people who are going to get in there and buy, and they have a new easy way to do it. Meanwhile, it, it's easier to own Bitcoin directly than it was to own a barrel of oil or a gold bar or a futures contract. When those things were introduced, it didn't change the overall price curve. I think there's two points that you're making. First is when you buy the CTF, you are not buying Bitcoin. You are buying exposure to Bitcoin. But if you want to actually own Bitcoin, take self-custody, you should definitely go do that and not do it through the ETF. The second thing, though, is this kind of greater fool theory. One thing I always say to people is, what is the most valuable commodity in the world? In my opinion, it's computing power. Bitcoin is the strongest computer network in the world. And so when you're buying Bitcoin, you're buying an asset that is backed by the strongest commodity in the world. So when you start to think of it from that perspective, yes, it is Internet native. Yes, it is for this kind of digital generation. But those people don't look at oil or gold or anything else is the most valuable commodity, they look at computing power, and that's why Bitcoin's so attractive to them. Can I ask you a very simple question? If I own Bitcoin through an ETF, do I have greater protection of my ownership of that Bitcoin interest than I did through some of the exchanges where I've heard some nasty stories? So it, you definitely have the exposure, and obviously it's a regulated entity. Uh, you have the ETF structure, all the things that I think Wall Street really enjoys about the protections of those regulated, uh, regulated funds. Uh, what you don't have, though, is direct exposure and ownership of Bitcoin itself. So one of the beauties of Bitcoin is similar to cash. You can go to the ATM, you can take the cash out of the machine. With Bitcoin, you can actually take self-custody. You can own it. You don't have to rely on any counterparty. You don't have to rely on an exchange. You don't have to rely on an ETF uh, provider, et cetera. And so people have to ask themselves, what is my comfort level? Am I comfortable taking self-custody or do I just want the financial exposure and I don't want to deal with that? And I think that that's where you're going to see a lot of people who have been sitting on the sidelines, institutions, they can't take self-custody. They need the ETF to be able to actually allocate to the asset. Hey, Anthony, the Coindesk, the block, a lot of different places are reporting on this matrix port report um, from an analyst who says that the SEC is going to say, forget it, they're going to reject the ETF, the spot Bitcoin ETF proposal. I know you think that's a real long shot. What would happen if, if they actually did do that, if the SEC said no? If they approve it, I think that there will be a lot of short-term volatility, and then we'll kind of get right back on track, whether it goes up or down after the approval. If they reject it, I think the same thing would happen. There would be a lot of kind of short-term volatility, and we'd get right back on track. The beauty is with Bitcoin, if we go back, we, we saw something like this. China had over 60% of all mining inside of their borders. They completely banned mining and kicked them all out. 50% of the hash rate went offline. By the end of that year, May of 2021 is when it happened. By the end of 2021, mining hash rate was back to an all-time high. And so this thing is just resilient, it's anti-fragile, and it continues to just do what it was designed to do. But that's true, although the risk reward, you know, the, 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 the returns based uh, per unit of volatility you cite, it really depends on the starting point. 
right? I mean, two and a half years ago, you were here, you were saying $100,000 really soon, we're going to get there on Bitcoin. And it's been nothing through this inflationary spike and a Fed tightening cycle. I, I always say, look, at $8,000, right? I thought I was going to 100. It only went to 70. I, yeah. was, off, I was off by a little bit, right? Um, but, but in terms of, I, th I think these directional moves, again, it goes back to, there is a lot of volatility here. Yeah. And I do think that the volatility will dampen as obviously ETFs and kind of more persistent sticky holders come into the market. But remember, we not, aren't just talking about an ETF either. We also have the having that's coming up at the beginning yeah. of Q2, and we've got to return back to loose monetary policy. And so I think that we're going to see a pretty serious, a significant move in Bitcoin. Just don't expect it to go from 45,000 to a million tomorrow. Right.